Good morning. Butch Eichels, the Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Well, good evening, everyone, on this Wednesday night. It's good to see everybody. Did uh, Was anybody able to enjoy a good meal over in the fellowship hall tonight? Wasn't that good to have the kitchen back open? And, um physical food. May the Lord give us some spiritual food tonight through through his servant brother Rusty. And I saw it looking really, really dark over here on this side. It just looked dark over on this side. That's all. It <laughs> What's over there now? Yes. Here's Marion. And it just Oh, man, praying for rain, praying for rain. So let's stand together and worship the Lord tonight, amen.
Well, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to praise the light. You are the light. Satan hates the light. And so we declare that you are the light of the world and you've come to reside in our hearts and you sing to those Christ-bearing ones, those, those Christ followers, you are the light of the world because Jesus, your light shines through us. And may it be this week in, in this place and in this county and in our state and, oh God, in our country and around the world, may the light of Jesus be sent forth, and may men, women, boys, and girls see the light, we pray. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be gathered together in this place, in this house, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Brother Butch and uh, Joan are um, at, a, at a visitation for a, a family uh, friend who passed away, and they're there um, ministering to that family and being present there, and so um, that's why, why they are not here this evening, but we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us tonight, if this is your first time to be at the country church, if you were wondering if you were at the country church after that first set of music, you probably don't need to wonder that anymore, um, but if this is your first time to be with us, if you wouldn't mind slipping your hand up, these, these couple of these ushers have a packet of material. Anybody, this is your first time. Right, right there. There we go. Right there in the in the middle. We are glad that y'all are here. If you wouldn't mind, take a take a packet and um, and in that packet has some information about the country church. And if you wouldn't mind, just taking a moment, read through that. There's a visitors card in there, and um, you can find a little bit about us. And maybe we can find out a little bit about you. That's Ralph that you're talking to, by the way. He's a good guy. Um, Anybody else? Ralph, you want to make another lap? <laughs> Anybody else you didn't get to greet while you were coming through that you need a <laughs> usher usher training takes place. Yeah, I don't know when that takes place, so <laughs> uh, so we're gonna continue to worship just for a bit and then uh, may it be that. May we we do sing songs, but may it, may it be more than just music, and may it be the meditations of our heart and the contemplations of our mind engaged in worship to the Lord tonight. And then, uh, Brother Rusty, you come and, and bring, bring the word. Amen. On Jordan stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful light to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the Shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? I am bound, I am bound for the promised land. I am bound. trade guitars for
Last week, we learned a song together called uh, What What He's Done. And I want to teach, remind you of that chorus together, and we'll try to, try to start singing it some together. Chorus goes. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God. For what he's done. Try that with what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Here's how the verse goes. See, on a hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Look. At the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done, what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. We'll sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. Thank you, Lord. Speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. Oh, what he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. And now. On a throne of majesty, the Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. What he's done, what he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. Oh, I praise God for what he's 
done. One more time. What he's done. What he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. I praise God for what he's done. Oh, I praise God for what he's Rusty, it's your turn. Most of you stayed, I guess, huh? Thank you. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew, the 16th chapter. I don't know about y'all, but my Bibles, the print keeps shrinking. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27. You stand with us? Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Father, uh, we're going to talk about basic training tonight. And remind us of those basic things that have to be in our life. I pray that you guide my lips. Uh, and, and just leave these folks with something to ponder and come closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, recently read about a, a, a true story about a preacher who was standing at the door shaking hands as the congregation departed. The service was over, and he was shaking hands, and he grabbed one man by the hand and pulled him aside. And the preacher said to him, you need to join the army of the Lord. The man replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord. The preacher then looked at, it, looked at him and questioned, well, how come I don't see you here? except for Christmas and Easter. And the man whispered back, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> I don't think God has one of those. Several years ago, I was exchanging some ideas with some folks that I went to school with, and, 
In the course of these conversations, I encountered a young man who was in the Army National Guard. He had just been called up to active duty to go to Iraq because the president had declared war on Saddam Hussein. Now, the promise, the problem for this young man was that he did not want to go. He explained that he hadn't joined the army to go to war. He joined because of the benefits and the pay and the college tuition and the insurance and all those kind of things. Listen, something's wrong with that kind of thinking. One of the primary functions of the military is to prepare for war. And you've got to know that before you sign up. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the description. I remember <laughs> when I was in the Air Force and uh, Colonel Bice had called a staff meeting and he was talking about our mission. Remember what your mission is. It's very sis simple. Our mission is is to break things and kill people. I worked, I was at a intercontinental ballistic missile base. We had boomers, if you get what I'm saying. To Russia with love. But, uh, but he was right. But there are people who actually join up hoping for a free ride. And that kind of mentality undermines the military of any nation. And that kind of mind, that kind of mentality, also can under, undermine a church. Too often believers sign up for the benefits. They expect Jesus to be there for them, but they don't expect to be there for him. And that's the issue that Jesus is addressing here in Matthew 16. In verse 24, it's, we read, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He's explaining to his disciples that they're part of his army. He's called them to war. And there's a decision to be made. In other words, it's not about the benefits. It's about picking up your cross and going into the trenches it's about being willing to lose your life for Jesus Christ. It's about being serious in our commitment with the Lord. You know, Jesus has been with his disciples for two years now. And he's been training them and he's been treating, teaching them and he's been exposing them to God's power. <clears throat> they have listened as he shared his teachings and his parables. They have seen him heal the deaf and the mute and the lame. They've even seen him raise a little girl from the dead. They've observed him performing powerful miracles. I mean, they were out there on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus came walking on the water. And again, they were on that same sea when he stilled a frightening storm by simply saying, peace, be still. They were there when, the, 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 when 5,000 men, along with their wives and children, were fed with five barley loaves and two little fish. And again, when he fed 4,000 and their families in a similar way. 
Well, just a few weeks before this story, we find in Matthew 14 that Jesus sent his disciples out to the surrounding villages to preach and to heal and to cast out demons. But now time is getting short. Jesus' arrest and crucifixion are only weeks away. And Jesus has to make it clear to them how serious their task is. So the first thing he does here is he lays down the foundation of their allegiance to him. In the early part of Matthew 16, he calls them together and asks, Who do men say that I am? And they reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And never at a loss for words, Peter pops up and and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commends him for it. Then he tells them that he has one final battle to fight. And he explains to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised from to, to life. And like Peter often did, he objects. Peter took Jesus aside to rebuke him. Now, can you imagine this? Peter's going to fuss at Jesus. I, I can't say what I'd like to say about that one. Uh, I don't know where I am now. (laughs) Should have shut up. (laughs) Well, he says, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. This isn't what Peter signed up for. Jesus has to live. He's not supposed to die. He's God in the flesh. But he's the long-expected king and Messiah. And Peter's like, not happening when I'm here. So Jesus rebukes him. And then Jesus gives the teaching we hear, we find here in our text tonight. Verses Verse, chapter 16, the verses 24 and 25. If any man will come after me, Jesus is speaking, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever wants to save his life will, will lose it, and whosoever loses his life for me will find it. In other words, Jesus is saying, boys, I've called you to war. And in war, you face the the possibility of death. That's what that man I was speaking to was worried about. He knew that once he, he once he went to the trenches, he would face ridicule and jokes and sneers, and he could even be ostracized. And he didn't want any of that. And here Jesus is telling his disciples and us that that is what we've signed up for. I, I, I preached on soul winning. I, I preached on go tell your family and friends how to know Jesus. And everybody seems to, to think that's the pastor's job. I want you to understand something. Your children, your parents, Your cousins, your friends at work will believe you 
and what you say about your relationship with Christ before they'll believe this preacher. And we have all of those opportunities just passing by all the time. Remember, I, I, I fear that when all is said and done, I fear, I think the most, that those that didn't trust Christ will look me in the face and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you talk to me about this? Jesus told us, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Jesus said, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 10, uh, that's Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Je in fact, Jesus said, and uh, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Matthew 10, 22. Paul wrote to Timothy, and said, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. People are going to laugh at you. People are going to make jokes about you. They're going to ridicule you. But when they get to hell, they'll regret it all. I've told you all the story about my dad. My dad was a very good man. But he just didn't, he, he thought, I am a good husband, a good father, a good mason. Uh, I'm a good employee. I'm a good worker. I treat people fair. I, I, I'm doing everything I can for God. And I am so glad the preacher never quit on him. My dad got saved about what, Mary Lou, two years, three years before he died? He's in heaven because the preacher wouldn't give up on him. Paul once described the things that he had endured. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. You think he didn't have some commitment? There's a reason why he wrote more, more of the Bible than anybody else. Eventually, Paul was executed for his faith, as were all the other apostles except for John and Judah. Why would he do that? Why would they put up with that suffering and danger and death? 
Paul did all that because he was convinced that Jesus was worth it. He was convinced that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, who had come to die for our sins and rise from the dead and give us hope. And he was preaching that 2,000 years ago. He was convinced there was a war to be fought and souls to be won. He was convinced that the fate of men and women around him depended upon his faithfulness as a soldier for Christ. When he was on trial be before King Agrippa, Paul declared that Jesus had told him, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who were sanctified by faith in Christ. You see, because Paul believed all that, he was convinced that it was worth it to deny himself and take up his cross and follow Jesus. And we're afraid to talk to the people across the street because they might get some attitude talking about Jesus and all the holy rollers and Do we really want to just ignore them and then when the judgment day comes, sneer at them for not listening to us? Or do, are we going to get on our face before God and ask him to touch those people's hearts? Most of us are probably... Uh, Face the kind of things that the Apostle Paul faced. I mean, in our country, we're not likely to be whipped or stoned or beaten with rods because of what we believe. Now, granted, Congress's new hate crimes legislation, we might end up in jail or face a financial hardship, but even that dangers, I think, still think a ways off. More than likely, we'll be faced with the challenge of realizing Christianity just ain't a Sunday morning thing. It's 24-7. Our faith calls us to be faithful to Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just on Sunday. A few years ago, a, a woman had <clears throat> the opportunity to talk to her son who was deployed to Iraq. He had called from, from there to say hello, and she, being a good Christian woman, asked him if he had to work on Sundays. Well, he paused for a moment and, and then said, Mom, we got to work every day. It's called war. Well, as Christians, we are soldiers of Christ. And we are at war with Satan every moment of every day, not just on Sunday morning. We are soldiers. We've been called to war. Given those facts, it's possible to misunderstand what God expects of us in this conflict. There are some Christians who believe that God calls us to fight like the world does. Not so. The world fights by getting angry. The world fights by getting even. Have you ever wanted to get even with somebody? Don't lie, because we all have. In fact, I got somebody right now that I'm, I'm negotiating with. <laughs> oh. 
The world fights by whatever they have to do to defeat their enemy. The end justifies the means. Well, some Christians use mean and hateful words to get their way. Some Christians spread rumors and gossip to discredit people they disagreed with. Some Christians destroy preachers and churches because they were in the right and that preacher was wrong. Paul tells us the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. To Timothy, Paul writes, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So we're not called to deny ourselves and take up our cross so that we can beat up on folks. We're called to deny ourselves because our way of doing things is different than God's way. My mama's way was get it done or get the stick. It worked for me. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be loving on people and reaching on people and never giving up on those people. God can always do something up until the point they die. Well, let's see, where am I? Can I let you in on a little secret? When you or I get angry or vengeful towards someone, it's a sign that we have forgotten to deny ourselves. And we've become tempted to pick up our cross and beat someone else over the head with it. That's our way of making war. God's way of making war is to help us understand we're not supposed to be out to get those people. We're not supposed to be out to destroy them. Why? Because they are our objective. We want those people in heaven with us, not in hell. Satan's the enemy, and Satan holds these people captive to do his will. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Our struggle is against the powers of this dark world and against the powers of of spiritual forces of evil. And that doesn't make sense to the people who don't belong to Jesus. Our enemy is not Al-Qaeda or Iran or the Russians or the Chinese. It's not the homosexuals. It's not the atheists. It's not the worker down at the plant that curses like a banshee. It's not the person that says mean things about you. 
It's not the guy that pulled out in front of you when you were driving down the street. Well, it might be him. <laughs> and made some rude gesture. I, I think I told y'all I, when my youngest son-in-law, Stephen, is a colonel in the Army, and he works at the uh, Rock Island Army Arsenal. And when I first, first time we went there after they had moved there, I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a G4. Is that what he said, Mary Lou? And I was like, don't talk to me in code. I don't know what that means. What's a G4? And he said, Dad, I'm responsible for every piece of weaponry and every piece of ammunition that the Army owns east of the Mississippi River. So I said, well, cool, man. You ought to be, you ought to have some old M60 from Vietnam laying around. I'd like to have one of them. He said, what do you want it for? I said, I want to mount it on my truck for them people in, on the road. His answer was, Dad, if I gave you a piece of spent brass, I will go to Leavenworth for 10 years. So he wouldn't give me it. He could have hid it and found it, and I could have got it. Well, let's see. The enemy in Al-Qaeda, Russia, Iran, Chinese, not the homosexuals or an atheist. The enemy is Satan. And if we beat him, we win the battle. And the only way to beat him is for us to take his captives away from him. When we turn the hearts of those around us and bring them to our Jesus to be saved, we're beating up on the devil. So this is a challenge for us as soldiers of Christ. But it's a big challenge. It can be overwhelming. And sometimes we almost believe that we're just too small to make much of a difference. I mean, after all, it doesn't seem like anybody else is doing this. And we feel like we're all alone in doing this. John Wesley once said, give me a hundred men who love nothing but God and hate nothing but sin, and I will shake the world for Christ. And he did. It doesn't take many, but it does take someone who decides to be faithful. In December 1944, the German army launched an unexpected attack. It was to become known as the Battle of the Bulge. The Nazis drove deep behind the Allied lines. Writing in World War II about the reaction of the American troops to this attack, James Jones said, none of these little road junction stands could have had a profound effect on the German drive. But hundreds of them impromptu little battles at nameless bridges and unknown crossroads had the effect of slowing enormously the German impetus. These little diehard one-man stands, alone in the snow and fog without communications, would, pre, would, would prove enormously effective out of all proportion to, the, to their side. In other words, we did what we could. And I personally think that God stepped into it and uh, confused the Germans just like he confused the Arabs. But listen, as Christians, we have a duty to Christ. 
And he's told us what he wants us to do. And that means share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everybody you come across will listen to you. Certainly not everybody you witness to is going to get saved. But the, nobody will get saved if we don't witness. And we ought to be able to have some, all of us have some friends, and we just need to not, won't be, not fear losing a relationship by bringing Christ into the, into, into the conversation. By the way, when you lead somebody else to the Lord, Remember, it's not you. It's Jesus Christ doing the saving. He's the only one who can. And he only works through his people. There's folks all over the place. I don't know what the population is around here anymore, like 4 million or something in this country. I don't have any idea. But my guess is at least 75% of them are on their way to hell. We're not on the way to hell because we're something special. Make sure you understand that. I... Uh, I knew when I got saved, I was in vacation Bible school. I was 10 years old. But I, had, I, I didn't know the name of the lady that led me to the Lord. And I get, uh, what is it, funeral notices from the, funeral home in my hometown and when they have the picture in the obituary thing I looked at her and I realized that's her Wardelia McDonald now I knew it was Mrs. McDonald but there was a bunch of them in our church and a, and a bunch of them in Westlake and I can finally remember, I, 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 I give everything I have to that lady for sitting me down and sharing the gospel and leading me to Christ. Folks, if it's never happened to you, if you've never led somebody to the Lord, you will never forget it. And you'll want to do it more and more and more. Dave, I got to shut up. Where'd he go? Oh, okay. Listen, I think most of the people in this room are saved. You wouldn't be here on Wednesday night. But I always think somebody probably isn't. We're fixing to offer an invitation. And if you've never really and truly surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ, tonight's the night. Don't put it off. There is no promise of tomorrow. Dave. Dave. Let's stand together. And as we sing through this familiar <coughs> refrain, if there is a decision in your heart, either to trust Christ as Savior or to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, that you need to make that, that uh, decision public uh, tonight so that the next time we put water in the baptistry, you, you might be one of those. Or if you feel like the Lord is drawing you to the country church, Rusty will be here at the front to receive you. Or if you just feel like that there is a something the Lord's dealing with you about 
being part of the Lord's army that you need to freshly commit to him as we sing. Would you make whatever decision the Holy Spirit prompts you to make tonight? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, and waiting. soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come Thank you Rusty thank you for coming tonight to remind you to be praying for the um, the Awana ministry, which launched again tonight, and uh, they've got tons of kids and some really great helpers. We need to be praying that the Lord will anoint this this year um, as there's an investment in these, in these young children. So let's pray together as we're dismissed. Um, would you pray with me? Master, we submit ourselves freshly to your word and your will, and would you cause us um, to be ambassadors for Christ in the army of the Lord as we move forth from this place tonight. We pray for these little ones over in the next building, and for each adult who's ministering to them. Lord, pour out your spirit upon them. May May these young ones come to know Jesus that don't know you yet. May the ones who do be discipled in the gospel ministry to be a salt and light where they go. Um, watch over us, Lord, we pray as we depart this place. Send physical rain, and, oh, Jesus, send your rain in our rule and rule in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Be safe going home. We'll see you on Sunday.